we're still talking about the tabernacle, right? We're still talking about the tabernacle, and we know that uh, the Israelites had escaped from uh, Egypt with the, the, by the hand of the Lord himself. We know they couldn't do it on their own, but God delivered them, right? How many of you have been delivered before? You've been in a situation you didn't know how you were going to get out of it, but you know it was God that got you out. Well, God got them out. But just like other humans, every now and then, these folk would forget what God had done for them, and they would begin to complain, right? And they would complain. They upset God several times. Already in the story, we've seen that God was so upset that he wanted to even destroy them, right? But Moses prayed for them. So the tabernacle is here to give them the opportunity to repent of their sins. They can bring a sacrifice. When, I, when they mess up, they can bring this animal sacrifice, which we know today was a representation of what God is going to do through Jesus Christ, right? But these animals represented them. So we're going to look at now. We know that Moses was the leader. Moses was the leader, but Moses was only following the direction of the Lord himself. Even in the construction of this tabernacle, every piece of it, God told him what to do, right? Even what, telling the people what to bring, okay? What type of offering to bring unto the Lord. Now, so we don't get the opportunity, listen, we don't get the opportunity to just decide what we're going to bring to God. And uh, now that's from the very beginning. Think with me for a minute. Remember Cain and Abel. Y'all remember that? One of them brought the wrong offering. Who was that? Cain. What did Cain bring? Yeah, he brought uh, some grain and, and some stuff from the field that he grew. But God wasn't accepting that offering. And he told them, and you know, Cain got angry about it. And he said, why are you angry, Cain? All you got to do is go do the what? Right thing. All right, so same thing today, my brothers and sisters. You can't decide what you're going to bring to God. God tells us what to bring, what's acceptable. And you have to follow his direction. Everybody understand that? So he said, bring a tenth, right? of your earnings and an offering, right? We want to bring a 8%, right? Or 7% or 2% some of us. But that's not what he said, okay? So we've got to follow his direction. So here Moses is in building the tabernacle following uh, his directions, amen. That's one of our students from Union, amen. God bless you. All right, now, it's craftsmen, craftsmen, that's what we are. We're looking at the people that God used to actually construct this particular tabernacle. That's what we're talking about. And, 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 and with the church, we've got to have the right attitude. We can't have everybody with a paintbrush in their hand. Come on, how many of you know you don't know how to use a paintbrush? Just be honest, right? You have more paint on the floor than you have on the wall, right? or more paint on yourself than you have on the wall because you do not know what you're doing. You don't, you don't have that skill. So we, we learned that God gave uh, this particular person the skill. Let me back up and see. Here it is. Look at 30. And Moses is, is calling this to their attention. Somebody read verse 30. We got to use a mic now. Somebody read. Who wants to read? Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Azel, son of Ura, the son of Hur Huror, of the tribe of Judah. All right. Moses is saying, See, that word see means pay attention. I mean, recognize. All right. Give me some gifts around here that you recognize. Anybody, raise your hand. A gift you recognize. Just one. Musicians. Musicians. All right, give me another one. Teachers. Everybody can't teach. Tell your neighbor you might want to, but you just can't do it. Everybody can't do that. Okay. How many of you have been to school? 
and you had some teachers, you say, they don't need to be here. Right? You can tell the teachers who just don't have it. And then you got the teachers talking about classroom management. For some strange reason, they don't even have to raise their voice. They just got it with us, right? And they can explain anything to us and get it done. Okay? So there are gifts are given, and, and Moses is saying, pay attention. See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And look at 31. And he has filled him. Who gave him the gift? Who gave Brother Baldwin his gift to use the ham and stuff? So don't, don't, don't blow his head up. Don't do that to him, right? God gave it to him for his own what? Purpose. There ain't no need of me being jealous of Brother Baldwin. Right? He can drive a nail in a few minutes. Take me a little while. I'm going to miss a couple times. All right? But he has that skill given to him by God, so there's no need for me to be jealous of him. Right? Every Sunday, I try to get Brittany to let John play a little bit. Why? John has a what? A gift. It doesn't matter what song it is. It could be any song. And just say, play a little while, John. And, and it, because God gave him that. And now, look, he's bringing his sister here. Y'all noticing? So show yourself what? Friendly. Be kind. Now his sister come in. And his sister walked out Sunday and shook my hand. She said, I'm bringing all my friends here. Now, see, y'all see what I'm trying to tell you? And I saw one of my sisters who was sitting next to her, Sister McGill, young Sister McGill was sitting next to her, and during the fellowship, she turned like this to the girl and hugged her. And I said, that's, that's it. Show what? Love, and God will do the work, okay? So we allow John to use his gift. John's sister came here. She loves it. And now she wants to bring what? more people here all right so he says see see what the lord pay attention and he has filled him with the spirit of what come on spirit of who with wisdom we talked about that sunday right with understanding and with knowledge we talked about those three things sunday three things sunday okay all right and wisdom comes from who all right and with understanding with knowledge and with all kinds of skills all right, so to make artistic designs, look what God put in him. For work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. This one man, God put all of that in him. Now, but watch this, look at 34. And... Did God just give it to Brother Baldwin to keep just for Brother Baldwin? Now, this is what Brother Baldwin do on the job. And, and I remember Brother Walker. Y'all remember Brother Walker? Brother Walker taught me a lot about how to cut wood and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so, look, look. It said, and he has given both him and Oholiah. Say it, Brother Paul. Say that name. I thought you was a scholar name calling. No, Ohai, Ohaliab, Ohaliab, and we're probably still saying it wrong, right? I mean, when you speak to a foreigner, they probably say it totally different from that, right? But I'm just going to use the English breakdown, Oholiab, Oliab, all right. So it was two of them, son of Ahisamach. Of the tribe of Dan, the ability to do what? So I have a skill. Now, listen, I'm going to tell all of you now. I have a skill to play music too. But that's not the end of my skill. I can teach you how to play music. Somebody say, oh, I, I don't have it. I know you don't have it. I have it. But I could teach you how to do it. And I tell folk it'll take you one year, one serious year now. 
And it don't take people long to quit because they don't want to go through the, the work of it. It's a real serious, hard working year and you'll be able to play. All right. So here, not only did God give them the gift, but he gave them the ability because they can't do all that work by themselves, right? So they're going to teach others. He has filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as what? What else? What else? Purple and scarlet, yarn and fine linen and weavers, all of them skilled workers and what? Now, uh, Sister uh, Kizzy and uh, her husband runs a business and we use them at the church to do everything for the church uh, and we're getting ready to do jackets for anybody who want one it's getting ready to get cold and they're gonna do jackets they're gonna do caps and things like that and the more of us that wear these things the more our name get out right all right so she's doing that but now she doesn't do it by hand okay in our time since the Industrial Revolution Listen, before the Industrial Revolution, everything was made by hand. So you had to have a lot of skill back in the day. All the way up to the Industrial Revolution. When the Industrial Revolution came about, machines came on the scene. My cousin Walter was telling me about uh, 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 Uncle Billy was working at a can company at one time. And uh, they thought they was doing something. They was doing a thousand cans a day. They was like, man, we rolled the day, a thousand cans. And then he said they put machines in there that do 10,000 cans a day. All right? So machinery, so Sister Kizzy and them own a machine that they program that does these things. And it does it like that. Now imagine doing this by hand. You need some what? Skill. Everybody understand? So now, these folk didn't have machines. This is what I want you to know. These folk did all of this by what? By hand. So they were very, very talented. Let me teach you a little history. Let me help you. History is broken down by four boxes. How many? Four boxes. You have ancient history. Say it back to me. The second box is the Middle Ages. You may, have heard, you may have heard it, the medieval period or the dark ages. Y'all heard that? Okay, that was a period where man fell off because uh, all the barbarians started moving down south into these areas and they began to, if you ever watched the movie The Vikings and all of that, these people started moving down and they took over Rome. They took Rome. And so we were ushered into the dark ages. We weren't learning anymore. We lost all of this skill that people had in ancient times. All right. The third box is called the modern era. What is called? Modern. The modern era. Some of you were born in the modern area. Uh, most of us in here uh, if you were born before 1980, okay, you were born in the modern era. But in 1980, we crossed into the postmodern era. What's the fourth box? And what ushered us into that was technology. That's when computers came on the scene. Computers changed the way we live. And everybody know that. And it's changing fast day by day. All right, but the ancient period, the ancient period, the people who came after the Middle Ages, they began to look back at these gifts and crafts. And they said, we need to go back to that. So that period that connected the Middle Age to the modern age was called the Renaissance. You ever heard that word? The Renaissance period is called new birth. They, they went, a rebirth is better. Rebirth is the word. They were reborn. They went back to the ancient times, picked up where they left off, and started from there. And that's when man began to question everything in the modern age. They began to question science. They started looking at the anatomy and started uh, saying, uh, let's explore the world. Is the world flat? Let's get out there and find out. Let's sail in the sea and find things. All of that came about after the Renaissance. People started questioning even the church. Okay, because the Catholic church was the organized church. 
and they found some corruption in the Catholic Church. They were selling forgiveness. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I mean, if you murdered somebody and you had a lot of money, sounds like the same thing going on today, right? If you murdered somebody and you had money, you can go to the church because at that time, the church was the superpower. In the church, the Pope will forgive you depending on what you put in the offering. Don't you try that with me, Jonathan. You still give me the offering. But I'm still going to call your sin a sin. Everybody understand me? But they would buy forgiveness in Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther King now. Martin Luther said, this ain't right. He was a priest inside the church. And he said, what we're doing is wrong. And he wrote a 95 thesis about it and nailed it on the Catholic church door. And everybody who came up to the door was reading it. And, and, the, and the Pope and, and all his boys got mad. And they said, we got to kill him. But he wasn't running now. But some of his friends said, man, let's get him out of town because uh, uh, they're going to kill him. They, his friends kidnapped him and took him out of town to safety. But that ushered in the Protestant Reformation. That's how the Baptist church, the Methodist church, all these different churches came on the scene. All that happened uh, right after the Renaissance period, okay? But look at this ancient time. These people had some real skill. Does any of our young girls not a soul today? I say young girls. Do you even know how to put thread in a sewing machine? Do, can you sew up a hem? All right. Now I understand nowadays that they get this little stuff they put in the hem and stick the other piece to it. Hem tape? That's a shame. Sin in the shame. All right. So these folk, I don't want you to look at these people as if they were old, ancient. Y'all follow? They had more skill than we could even imagine. And y'all know that. The pyramids from that same period. People go there today and say, wow, man, how they did that. So these people were very skilled. And here they are in ancient time, same way. But they received theirs from God, right? All right, there are those names again. So, Bazalel, Oholiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability. Who gave it to him? To know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary ought to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. Who's supposed to do the work? Those who have the what? The skill. And then even though you have the skill, you still had to do it the way God say do it. Everybody with me? All right. So God is still in control. All right. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Oholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. Now, key word in there. Willing. We have folk. Now, let me say something to you. Teach you a little something about God. Even though God give you the talent, he's not going to force you to use it. There are folk who have great talent, but they rather use it in the world because their interest is what? Money. Okay? So, but God don't take their talent from them. Now, I know some of us say, well, if I was God, right, and I gave them a skill to use for me, and they go in the world and use it, I'll take it from them. But God doesn't do that. God doesn't take things from you. And we hear people saying, oh, see, if you don't use it, that's a lie. That's not true. See, that's stuff we say. That ain't in the Bible. Okay? Even though he gave them the skill, he put the skill in them. 
he had the plan for them to follow, he still wanted them to be willing. Even though you can sing, I mean, you have a great voice. You have the skill to, to touch hearts with your voice in, in, in God's words, right? But God still want you to be what? We shouldn't have to beg you just because you can sing. You still ought to be begging God to use you. Don't let your talent blow your head up. Don't let your talent push you further away from God. Your talent should draw you closer to God. You ought to be willing to use it, not to show it off to bring attention to yourself. All right, let's, let's read, let's read uh, verse 3. We're at 36, 1 through 4. That's where we are. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry. So they gave everything to the two contractors. Y'all follow that? All the stuff that we collected and we already talked about. Did the people bring enough? Did the people bring enough? I hope y'all get that in your head. Some of you have this attitude at work. I'm going to do only. Come on now. Come on. Let me help you learn how to get promoted. I'm going to do only what I'm supposed to do. No more. And I know it's true, Brother Cal, because it's true here. We do pay somebody to make sure the church is clean for Sunday. But does that mean you can't pick up a piece of paper when you walk by? Some of us have that attitude. Well, somebody paid to do that. I ain't picking that up. That ain't my job. And that's how you are at work. And you wonder why they never move you out that position. You've been there 35 years. And you see everybody else getting promoted and you still in the same spot and you can't figure out why. But these people brought more than what God asked for. Matter of fact, they brought so much, God himself. Not Moses now. Moses was just a man. Come on, bring it on in here. Put it on over there. Bring it on. God has said, Moses, what you doing? Tell him don't bring another thing. What a great day it's going to be. I know it's going to happen here at Pleasant Valley. That we're going to have to stand and say, members, I mean it now. Don't bring another nickel to this church. Y'all out your minds. I know it's coming. I'm getting excited. That day is going to come. I'm going to be all on CNN because they're going to say, man, you've never heard this in church. And I'm going to be mad about it. I mean, don't bring another nickel up in here. That day coming. All right. So they gave all the stuff. Y'all with the story now? Who they gave the stuff to? What's their names? Y'all forgot them too, huh? Come on. All right. The two contractors, right? The two guys with the skills. The two teachers, right? They, they were going to be in charge. Listen, we can't build nothing if everybody in charge. All right. What are we going to call What's The other one start with B? We're going to call them B and O. You're not black folk, do it. All right. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and began doing this work. All right. Now, we're skipping all over this because we're going to cover the whole thing. Now we're moving to the court. The, there's a courtyard. We're going to focus right now on the part of the tabernacle that is the courtyard. Everybody with me? So on your paper, write courtyard. Okay, we're talking about the tabernacle, the courtyard. Let's learn everything that the Bible says about the courtyard. 
That was a yard inside the fence. All right, y'all see the courtyard there? All right, y'all see the Holy of Holies. Y'all see that in the back? But in the courtyard, you see that's where they make the burnt offerings. Y'all see the smoke right there and all of that? All right, so we're going to talk about that particular part right there. All right, God is giving Moses instructions. Who's giving the instructions? Make a courtyard for the tabernacle. The south side shall be a hundred cubits long and is to have curtains of finely twisted linen. Okay, remember, everything was hand done. These curtains had to be made. They didn't have a machine to run these curtains. So these curtains were made with 20 posts and 20 bronze bases and with silver hooks and bands on the posts. All right, and that's what it would have looked like. Okay, and he gave instructions on how to make those posts and what's supposed to be on the bottom of the posts was supposed to be on the top of the post, right? Everything there. The north side shall also be a hundred cubits long and is to have curtains with 20 posts and 20 bronze bases and with silver hooks and bands on the posts. The west end of the courtyard shall have shall be 50 cubits wide and have curtains with 10 posts and 10 bases. On the east side toward the sunrise the courtyard shall also be 50 cubits. So you see there's two sides with 50, two sides with 100. So what's the shape? Is it a square or a rectangle? So we got a rectangle, right? If you build and you got a square, you did something wrong. <laughs> All right, something ain't right. Okay, because they got 100 cubits on uh, two sides and 50 on the other. Uh, curtains 15 cubits long. How long are the curtains? See, even the length of the curtains, right, ought to be on one side of the entrance with three posts and three bases. The courtyard shall be 100 cubits long and 50 cubits wide. Okay, we're moving to 2718. With curtains of finely twisted linen, five cubits high and with five bronze bases. So was these things written once or more than once? More than once the instructions are given. So the courtyard in our language uh, uh, was fenced in, and it was about seven and a half feet high, okay? Uh, so as tall as Shaq is. So the average person could not see inside the courtyard if they were on the outside of it, right? And, and most of these eastern people were short, okay? They were not tall people, all right? But even... Um, the average American is shorter than seven and a half feet. So nobody could really see inside the courtyard. Okay? Made of linen and the posts were also seven and a half feet apart. Okay? Seven and a half feet apart. Okay? You have, seven, you have a post seven and a half feet. You have another what? Post. Okay? So he gave him all the instructions. And the curtains were seven and a half feet high. All right, let's look at the entrance of the courtyard. It would have looked something like that. Okay, now I want you to pay attention to uh, the curtain itself. Remember, no machine made that curtain. These people had to do this how? By hand. So you had to really know what you were doing with a needle, sewing and putting colors and all of that together. Uh, uh, what, what, there's something that when I was young, a lot of senior women used to do. It's, I think it's called crochet. I'm saying it right. All right, and they will work on that thing sitting on the porch, right? Forever. You, uh, you wouldn't even know what they were doing at first. And then you come back a couple uh, weeks, you're like, oh, that's coming out pretty, right? And you don't know what they're making. And they're mixing all of these colors. So that was a skill that a lot of our young people do not have today. They don't have skills to uh, do those kind of things, but they would make these curtains. All right, let's move on. Uh, 27, 16 through 19. For the entrance, we're talking about the entrance of the courtyard. Y'all with me? We're talking about the entrance to the courtyard. I want to get in. For the entrance to the courtyard, provide a curtain 20 cubits long of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer with four posts and four bases. All the, bolts are, 
posts, I'm sorry, around the courtyard are to have silver bands and hooks and bronze bases. All right? The courtyard shall be 100 cubits long and 50 cubits wide. Did y'all hear that before? It's like they're saying it over and over, right? With curtains of finely twisted linen five cubits high and with bronze bases. All the other articles used in the service of the tabernacle, whatever their function, including all the tent pegs. Now those posts, they had a, a, a line with a tent peg that they put in the ground for it. And those uh, for the courtyard are to be made of what? Bronze. Even the pegs that went in the ground was made of the best. The curtain for the entrance to the courtyard was made of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen. The work of an embroiderer, right? It was 20 cubits long and like the curtains of the courtyard, five cubits high. With four posts and four bronze bases, their hooks and their bands were silver and their tops were overlaid with what? All the tent pegs of the tabernacle and of the surrounding courtyard were what? Same thing. So these instructions were given over and over and over again and there should be no mistakes made. Right? How many of you have been on the work site where the uh, contractors took their eyes off the instructions and messed up? And, and look, look that, that messed up the rest of the building. Because if the, if the foundation is off by a foot, all right, when it's time to put the walls up, something is off, right? So you can see here that these instructions were given more than once, and uh, they, they were purposely given with every detail in it. And they were to follow these uh, guidelines to the letter. All right, let's talk about the curtains now. We talked a little about them, but let's, let's, let's look at the curtains. This is God giving instructions. Make the tabernacle with ten curtains. How many? A finely twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. So what are they talking about? Cheap stuff? And cherubim. Now watch this. When you're making the curtains... Put some cherubims in it. What is a cherubim? If you don't know, just you don't know. That's angels. So I want you to not just make curtains, but I want you to design angels in it. Did they have machines back there? Could they program this? They had to do this by hand. Woven into them by a what kind of worker? All right. So this wasn't for everybody. Okay. Now, in the church, don't get your feelings hurt if we're painting and I say, no, brother, I don't need you to do that. All right? I, you know, don't, don't, don't get your feelings hurt. Okay? That's the same thing. Last week, we talked a little about this. Brother Cal said he wanted to play Sunday. But no, I need him to sit right there and let somebody else do that. All right, because we'll have a lot of noise going on in here. All right, and the same thing with the skills that's done around here. Certain people are not used the saw, right? The tape measure, they don't even know how to read it. Okay, we can't ask everybody, measure that across there. They're going to give you the wrong number. Okay, because they don't understand it. So, skilled workers. Okay, that's what it would have looked like. Okay, y'all see the angels in it? Now, can anybody go home and make that by hand? Anybody in here today? If I give you all the colors that you need, could you go home and make that by hand? With those angels. Look at the feathers on the angels. Look at the detail. Look at it now. Look at the detail. It's just not a white line, right? Okay, so... It took somebody with some real skill. All right. Now, this furniture is uh, cheap stuff. Uh, one day we're going to buy the real stuff. One day. We're waiting on one of y'all to uh, give too much. All right. But see, this stuff here was carved out by a machine. These, these are pieces. They put this together. These are various pieces that they glued together. See, if you drop too much water on this here, 
Y'all know if a flood come through here, all right, all this is going to be all over the place. It's going to come apart because it's glued together. This is not one solid piece. Now, what they did in ancient days, they took a tree this big, you understand, and carved out all of that design. Uh, what's that word? In the Bible, they call it acacia, okay, which was the best wood of that time, okay? And they would carve out, like all of these letters in here, this was done by a machine, right? But you would have to carve this out. Okay, now we do have people that can do that today. We have people that can do that today. Uh, and some of them are not, uh, some of them are foreigners, like uh, Indian folk. They still have that skill. All right. All the curtains ought to be the what? Come on, church. All the curtains ought to be the what? Now, listen to me. In other words, it ought to look uniform. Now, if we have pews, everybody volunteer and bring a pew. We have one pew out here, one in here, one way over here. The church ought to look uniform. All right? We have two televisions in the back. Right? Now, suppose we're about a 50-inch on one side and a 30-inch on the other side. Oh, that's good. At least we got them. No. Decent and what? Everything. These air conditioned vents, you can see they, they spaced out the same. Everything ought to look nice. We got flowers on this side. We ought to have one what? On the other side. Everything ought to be uniform. Everything. So you've got to take pride in that. But look, he's telling them right there. All the curtains ought to be the same size, 28 cubits long and 4 cubits wide. Join five of the curtains together and do the same with the other five. Make loops of blue material. Y'all see this? Along the edge of the end of the curtain in one set and do the same with the end of the curtain in the other set. Make 50 loops on one curtain and 50 loops on the end curtain of the outer set with the loops opposite each other. So all of this instruction, we just reading through the Bible, and I'm doing this purposely because a lot of times people skip this. It's like, I ain't reading all that. We skip all of that, and we have partial understanding. So we're just reading through it, all right? So we're talking about right now the curtains made of linen. Y'all see that word linen up there? Then make 50 gold claps and use them to fasten the curtains together so that the tabernacle is a unit. All, all those who were what? Among the workers made the tabernacle with 10 curtains of finely twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with cherubim woven into them by expert hands. By what kind of hands? All right. Uh, should we allow anybody to drive the church bus? Come on now. Some of y'all napping don't know who driving. All right. Y'all ought to be in the hands of somebody who has some training, right? Who know how and have the license to operate that piece of machinery. All right. All the curtains were the same size. All the curtains were what? 28 cubits long and four cubits wide. I'm just pointing out stuff to you. They joined five of the curtains together and did the same with the other five. In other words, he told them what to do. Now this scripture is saying they did it. Okay. Then they made loops of blue material along the edge of the end curtain in one set. And the same was done with the end curtain of the other set. They also made 50 loops. In other words, he's just answering. He told us what to do. This scripture is saying this is what they did. They also made 50 loops on one curtain and 50 loops on the end curtain of the other set with the loops opposite each other. Then they made 50 gold claps and used them to fasten the two sets of curtains together so that the tabernacle was a unit. Make curtains. Here's some more instructions. Now, uh, what kind of curtains are we making now? Look up there in the uh, gold letters. What kind? Gold hair. Anybody got gold hair curtains in their house now? Tammy and I got to go shop for some more curtains right now. 
we had curtains that's been up there since we moved there and uh, we have grandchildren now and um, my sweet grandbaby who I love so much uh, journey went to the curtain by the, the little f a part in this uh, shear that has a little flower in it you know little flowers in it you know beautiful right put her little finger in the flower rip and they came in pieces so I took that piece out and I told Jen I said you owe me $20 for that Put that piece back. So everything was looking good. We looked back the other day. More holes in the curtain. So we know our curtain is not made of goat skin. All right? So God is asking for the, we're going to have to find some goat skin, Tammy, goat hair. Make curtains of goat hair for the tent over the tabernacle, 11 altogether. How many? All 11 curtains are to be the what? What size? 30 cubits long and 4 cubits wide. Now, this is what they did with that skin thing. They put it on the top. Didn't y'all see it? Find the goat hair. Y'all see it? Now, the goat hair is like the first layer. No, linen is. Y'all see linen? Then you got what? Goat hair on top of that. Then they're going to put what? Ram skin dyed red on top of that. And then badger skin. Now, if you got a leak on your roof, throw some of that skin on top of it. Go on about your business. All right? So now, y'all can see that they had to put a lot of work into this. This is how they covered it. Okay? They didn't have a roof like we have today. Okay? So this is how they covered it. So God is giving instructions. Join five of the curtains together into one set and the other six into another set. Fold the six curtain double at the front of the tent. Make 50 loops along the edge of the end curtain in one set and also along the edge of the end curtain in the other set. All right, they put these loops in it so they can put string in it and tie it down and tack it to the ground, okay? Then make 50 bronze claps and put them in the loops to fasten the tent together as a unit. As for the additional length of the tent, tent curtains, the half curtain that is left over is to hang down at the rear of the tabernacle. So some of it's going to hang off the back. Keep what out of it? Well, they're not going to have that much water. Keep the sun out too. Okay, because remember, they were in the wilderness, right? The tent curtains will be a cubit longer on both sides what is left will hang over the sides of the tabernacle so as to cover it okay now that's that's the materials now let's look at who's going to be the ones working in the tabernacle the steward a steward is one whose uh, job is to take care of somebody else's property now how many of you realize that you're only a steward listen I know we get papers that tell us we own something, but you don't own a thing. There's only one owner in the world. Who is that? And that's not Donald Trump now. Who is the, who's the only owner? God is the only owner. The rest of us are managers. Okay? We're managers. In other words, he gave you something and told you to take care of it. If you are in a house and you refuse to paint it, God is not pleased with you. If you refuse to cut your grass and pressure wash your sidewalk and take care of the property God has given you, he's not pleased with you. Because you're unappreciative to what he's given to you. If you have a car that you don't wash, quiet in here. You don't vacuum the carpet in your car. When you die, the car will still be here. So that proves it's not yours. God is allowing you to use it, and he expects you to be responsible and take care of it. If you have clothes that you don't wash, and you wear them to church Sunday after Sunday, not only is God 
upset, but I am too, because I can smell you. <laughs> you don't even have to get that close to my smell you coming. All right? So we are managers. We are managers. And God expects you to be a good steward. So he put some people in charge of the tabernacle, right? All right, let's see who the stewards are. The stewards who are the priests, the overseers. And we're going to look at several things starting on, uh, well, we're going to start today. We have a few minutes. Number one, we're going to look at the garments for the high priest, and we already kind of looked at it. Secondly, we're going to look at the garment of the other priests. Did all the priests wear the same thing? All right, we're going to see that they didn't wear the same thing. We're going to look at the food for the priests. Now, say pay. Say pay. This is how they got paid. You got paid by the food. And we talked about that a little bit back then. They didn't have money or a Walmart to even go to. So what they would do to pay the priests is through food. Okay, because that's what we do with money anyway, right? We take money and we go to the grocery store first, right? And make sure we have something to eat. Okay. All right, so we're going to look at the offerings for the priests, the dedication and anointing of the priests, the regulations for the priests, the beginning of the priestly ministry. Oh, well, we're going to have to wait the next week because I don't have none of that on here yet. No, it's not ready yet. Okay. After we do the priest, we're going to look at the sacrifices. Okay. I just got it all laid out like this. I didn't go any further. All right. We're going to stop right there. All right. So next week, we will be looking at the stewards. You will learn everything about the priest and the Levites who assisted the priest. Okay. That's where we're going next week. Okay. And we're going to get some of this stuff straight about how you feel about a preacher and some of the things that preachers tell you that's not true. Okay? That's not true. All right? Now, they have some rights and benefits because of what they do, but the priest didn't live any higher than anybody else. Say that back to me. Now, they didn't live any higher than anybody else. Don't let them tell you they're supposed to have a mansion on the hill and helicopters and boats and all that. That's just a lie. Now, at the same token, they didn't live any lower than anybody else. Y'all with me? Now, some of us don't want them high, and I don't blame you, but some of them you want, want, don't want them even in the middle, want them low. All right? But they should live just like you live. Okay, they should live like you live. All right, so we're going to look at that on next week. Any questions about what we've talked about so far? So we looked at the materials. We looked at the skilled workers. We got a good understanding of who's, how they got the materials, where it came from. Who remembers where all that stuff came from in the first place? The people where? In Egypt, right? When they were kicking them out, they gave them all that stuff. They didn't find this stuff in the desert, all right? They already had all that stuff, and they gave freely from their heart what God had given to them because they were slaves. They had nothing. But God blessed them when they left there. They had plenty, okay? So we've got a good understanding. Now next week, we're going to look at how this tabernacle operates. What are they doing in here? What are we supposed to do in here? Okay, what is this all about? So we're going to look at it from the very beginning. All right, God bless you. Amen. God bless you. you